we have been discussing the first, uh, or rather the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, which is Paul's treatise on the resurrection of Jesus. And we come now to discussing the structure and the content of the tradition that Paul handed on. Let's read again this tradition that Paul himself uh, received from those in Christ before him and which he then passed on to his converts in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 5. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. And now comes this four-line formula. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Now notice that this formula has a structure of four lines which are parallel to each other. The first and third lines are parallel, the second and fourth lines are parallel to each other. Nevertheless, each of the lines begins with, uh, in the Greek, the words kai hati. That is to say, and that. And often these are omitted in English translations, but they're there in the Greek. That Christ died, and that he was buried, and that uh, he rose, and that he appeared. And this grammatically unnecessary enumeration of the events serves to show that each line is an in, in a separate fact. It is equally important, equally emphasized. Uh, it orders them, as it were, first, second, third, and fourth, so that uh, these are the central facts of the passion of Christ, uh, as we see from a comparison of this outline with the passion narrative in the Gospels. Now, Paul then begins to pile up additional witnesses in the ensuing verses. After saying he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve, there seems to come a break here that seems to be the end of the formula, but then Paul adds more witnesses that he's aware of. Then, he says, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now what Paul is enumerating here are the witnesses to the risen Lord. This is not a list of appearances, it's a list of witnesses. That is to say, there could have been multiple appearances to some of these people, like the twelve disciples. And in the Gospels, we have several appearances to the twelve uh, narrated. Similarly, there is no appearance listed here to the women. We know in the Gospels that Jesus appeared to women. Why are they omitted from the list? Because in first century Palestine, their uh, credibility as witnesses was not recognized. Uh, women were not thought to be uh, credible witnesses uh, who could bear testimony, and therefore they are quietly omitted from the list. What Paul is listing here is not the appearances of the risen Christ, but he's listing the principal witnesses who saw uh, Christ risen from the dead. Now let's go through the list as well as the additional witnesses that Paul adds. First is Cephas. This is Simon Peter, Jesus' chief disciple. This same appearance is also mentioned in Luke 24, verses 53 to 54. We won't read that now. Uh, actually, sorry, I misread that. It's Luke 24, 33 to 34. Luke 24, 33 to 34. We'll look again at these appearances in more detail later, but I want to just alert you to the fact that uh, some of these are attested elsewhere. So the appearance to Peter is attested also by Luke. The next appearance is to the twelve, which refers to this group of original disciples that Jesus had selected to follow him, and included originally Judas, 
uh, though he betrayed Christ and then fell away. This appearance is also mentioned in Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 43, as well as John 20, verses 19 and 20. Luke 24, 36 to 43, and John 20, verses 19 and 20. This is the appearance on uh, Easter evening in the upper room in Jerusalem. Then Paul says Christ appeared to more than 500 people at one time. We have no other reference to this appearance anywhere uh, in the New Testament. And so scholars have simply been left to speculate as to whether it might not be identified with one of the other resurrection appearances that is mentioned. This is the only place that it is mentioned explicitly in the New Testament. Then uh, comes the appearance to James. This is also unique uh, to Paul's letter. Uh, it is not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. Um, but you'll recall that when Paul visited Jerusalem uh, in AD uh, 36, uh, three years after his conversion on the Damascus Road, he said that the two apostles that he spoke with were Peter and James, the Lord's brother. And so this is doubtless a reference to uh, Jesus' younger brother James. We know from the Gospels that James was not a follower of Christ during Jesus' lifetime. Um, John chapter um, 7 verses 1 to 10 relates a very ugly story of how Jesus' younger brothers tried to goad him into a death trap by getting him to go up to Jerusalem when they knew that the authorities were seeking Jesus' death. Uh, and John, uh, as well as Mark, says that none of his brothers believed in him. And yet, when you read the book of Acts, from Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, uh, on through the rest of the narrative, James is a believer. He is uh, one of the three principal pillars of the Jerusalem church, and eventually he becomes the sole elder and sole leader of the mother church in Jerusalem. And so this appearance to James that is mentioned by Paul seems to have been the pivotal event in Jesus' younger brother's life that changed him from a skeptic and unbeliever to being an ardent follower of Jesus. Then Paul says he appeared to all the apostles. This is probably not a reference to the twelve since they've been mentioned already, but to a wider group of uh, missionaries. Apostle means a person who is sent out and could include people, for example, like Barnabas uh, as well as the original twelve. And for the existence of such a group, look at Acts chapter 1, verses 21 to 22. Acts chapter 1, verses 21 to 22, refers to those who from the beginning were followers of Jesus from the time of the, uh, his baptism by John the Baptist up through his resurrection. And it's from that wider group that a replacement for Judas is selected. And so um, we have here a reference to all of the early apostles that Paul knows about. And then finally, Paul gives us his first hand encounter with Christ. He says, then he appeared also to me. And we have a narrative of this event in Acts chapter 9. In Acts 9, 1 to 19, we have an account of Jesus' appearance to Paul uh, on the road to Damascus. And this is then repeated twice more in the book of Acts. So this is the content of the um, uh, tradition that Paul is delivering to the Corinthians that includes um, these resurrection witnesses uh, to Jesus alive after his death. So the purpose of enumerating these witnesses, of piling them up, is to give evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. As we'll see, this is going to play a key role in Paul's refutation of the Corinthian heresy, which it says that there is no such thing as a resurrection of the dead. And so Paul wants to pile up the witnesses here. Uh, he's giving a historical proof by the standards of his time by enumerating the witnesses who had seen Jesus risen from the dead. Any comment or question then on 
these first uh, 11 verses. Yes, Taiwan. Um, Dr. Craig, uh, we all know the account that Paul encountered Jesus, and it was not a physical Jesus. It's a spiritual understanding and communication that other people couldn't validate except some sounds. And so with what right does Paul so, put himself in the list of witnesses? Right, that, so I was wondering whether the resurrection is in that order that these disciples and apostles, they have this this encounter, which I do not deny the reality of their hearing sound or uh, seeing Christ, but yet it's not for everybody to validate it. Okay, Taiwan is raising an issue that is right at the center of discussions of the resurrection and Paul's discourse here. In putting himself in this list of witnesses, is Paul sort of special pleading for himself um, by saying, I saw Christ risen from the dead, even though, as Taiwan characterized it, what he really had was just a sort of subjective vision that nobody else experienced. Or is he implying, as Taiwan seemed to suggest, that the other appearances were just as subjective as his own, that they were not, in fact, um, bodily, physical appearances? Well, we'll talk about this more when we get to the question of the nature of the resurrection body, which is the second part of this chapter. But let me say by way of preview, when you read the Corinthian correspondence, there were people in Corinth uh, who had been influenced by these sort of super apostles, as Paul calls them, who denied Paul's apostleship. They said that Paul wasn't a real apostle. He was a sort of second-rate guy. And so Paul has every incentive to include himself in this list of eyewitnesses. He wants to show that he is a real apostle, that he too has seen Jesus uh, the Lord, and therefore he deserves to be in this list. However, I don't think this means that Paul is misrepresenting his experience. Um, Paul's experience, unlike all of the others that he names in the list, was unique in that it was a post-ascension encounter. The other appearances all happened prior to Jesus' ascension into heaven, and that was the terminus. But then Paul's encounter uh, on the Damascus Road was a post-ascension encounter with Jesus, which made it unusual. Now, it was still not the same thing as a subjective vision of Jesus. And here I think it's very instructive to compare Stephen's vision of Jesus in Acts chapter 7 with Paul's encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9. Stephen, when he was stoned, saw the Son of Man glorified in heaven. And no one else saw or heard anything. Those standing around saw nothing and they rushed upon him and stoned him to death. What Stephen saw was a subjective vision uh, of Jesus in heaven, ascended into heaven. He didn't see Jesus risen from the dead in space and time there in front of him. By contrast, Paul's encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road was not a heavenly vision. Um, it had extra mental accompaniments, namely the light and the voice which Paul's traveling companions also experienced. They did not receive a message as Paul did, but it says they heard the voice. They saw the light. And so Paul's encounter, though quasi or semi-visionary in character in that it was a post-ascension encounter, was nevertheless a real resurrection appearance because it took place in the external world, not just in Paul's mind. There were these extra mental manifestations of the light and the voice which Paul's traveling companions also experienced. And so I think that Paul can, in good conscience, include himself in a list of witnesses to the risen Christ because his experience was qualitatively different from that of uh, visions of Jesus such as Stephen experienced and that Paul himself experienced 
on other occasions. And I think that Paul hints at that when he says, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Paul recognized that his experience was out of joint chronologically, so to speak, with the others. But nevertheless, it was a real appearance of Jesus and not just a subjective vision, uh, which were experiences that Paul was also familiar with and could differentiate from a resurrection appearance. We'll talk about that more later on, but for now, I, I wanted to address it. All right, any other discussion? Yes, uh, James. Well, um, I was wondering about <clears throat> chapter one of Acts, um, and, if, and if that makes, uh, if that is actually a reference to the, the 500 witnesses, because um, ah. I, I don't want to read the whole thing, because, I mean, you'd have to read the whole chapter, but basically, um, um, if you look at the Ascension, um, there's a verse 11, it says, men of Galilee, it's capitalized, so it's a proper noun. So is this, so is this a larger group than, the, uh, than just the, the 12 apostles? Because then you go on again, uh, they travel back to the upper room, verse 15 here, it says, Peter stood up, stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering of about 120 persons yeah, right. were there together, and then, so is that, is it, is it, is that, is it? It's possible, okay. James. Again, you know, we can only conjecture. I tend to think of these appearances that you're talking about here in Jerusalem uh, with the 120 and, and those who were with them to be perhaps to be identified with the uh, appearance to all the apostles when he says, then he appeared to all the apostles. That seems to me to be more plausibly identified with this group you're referring to. But... There's no way to know for certain uh, it could well be um, what you said. Yes, Cash. Uh, this might fall under the same kind of, uh, it, it's just not super clear, but it could be a suggestion at the end of Matthew 28. Uh, so you already know what I'm talking about. Yes, go ahead, though. <laughs> so um, it talks about, uh, let's see, I'm looking for the this verse. This is the mountaintop appearance exactly. in the final chapter of Matthew. Right. So going back to verse, let's say, 8, um, it talks about that they uh, departed from the tomb and they ran to tell the disciples the news. But the disciples there, you know, we're not sure how many that is. That could have been hundreds of people or it could have been just a, a handful. But then Jesus meets them. Uh, they worship him. Then he says, go on and go to Galilee where you'll see me there. And then... Uh, you know, he 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 meets. Uh, they have the the scheme to say that the body was stolen in the night, and then they travel to the to Galilee in verse sixteen to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, and then he he gives the great commission. So, yeah, I I'm, I like thinking of that the mountain where he had directed them was maybe the Mount of Olives and that there was maybe hundreds of people there and that he, as he gives the Great Commission, his last big statement, that this is his marching orders to his, his whole army of disciples at that point. But of course, it, it's not clear. It doesn't say that. Not clear, but certainly possible. Um, it was in Galilee that 5,000 people gathered to hear Jesus preach. You remember on the hills, and he fed the 5,000. And uh, in Mark, 4,000 men plus women and children had gathered to hear Jesus. So is it possible that this could have been a gathering of 500 disciples? Interestingly enough is the phrase uh, that you didn't mention in verse 17. Uh, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Now, that wouldn't seem appropriate for the 12, would it, if they, they were the only ones that were there? Could they have been part of this wider group that uh, had gathered? So, I, again, I think that's a real possibility. Now we turn to the uh, second half of this first part of the chapter on Christ's resurrection as evidence of our resurrection. Uh, and this is in verses 12 to 34. So let's read these verses uh, together. 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 12 to 34. Now, if Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you 
say that there is no resurrection of the dead. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all men most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And then quoting the Psalms here, For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. End quote. But when it says all things are put in subjection under him, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things under him, that God may be everything to everyone. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why am I in peril every hour? I protest, brethren, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Come to your right mind and sin no more. But some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Now what is Paul's basic argument in this section? He's not citing the resurrection appearances as merely some sort of apostolic legitimation of himself. Rather, Paul is presenting an argument here uh, against the Corinthian heresy. And it's basically a three-step argument. It goes like this. Premise one, if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. But, premise two, Christ has been raised from which it follows logically, therefore three, the dead are raised. So this is a wonderful example in Paul's letters of the use of a simple logical syllogism uh, to argue against the Corinthian heresy. If, as the Corinthians said, the dead are not raised, then it follows that Christ hasn't been raised from the dead. But, he says, Christ has been raised from the dead, from which it follows that therefore the dead are raised. Simple logic. And the recitation of the witnesses to the um, appearances of Christ 
constitutes the, the evidence for, whoops, for premise two. That's why Paul lists the witnesses, keeps piling them up, because he wants to show that this second premise is true. And this premise uh, appears in verse 20. So verses 12 and 13 says, If Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. That's premise one. Then premise two is in verse 20, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, from which it follows therefore the dead are raised, the Corinthian heretics are in error. So what Paul is doing in 1 Corinthians 15 is refuting the Corinthian heresy by means of the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, uh, presenting a simple logical argument. Now in the course of this argument, he also explores what consequences there would be if Christ has not been raised. And these are mentioned in verses 13 to 19 and verses 29 and 32. In 13 to 19, he says that if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is in vain, our preaching is in vain, we apostles are even found to be misrepresenting God, uh, lying about God because we've said he raised Jesus from the dead. Um, and, and also then he says those who have fallen asleep in Christ have just ceased to exist. There's no hope of ever seeing your loved ones again. Um, they're, they're dead and gone. And then in verses um, 29 to 32 uh, he talks about this peculiar practice. We, again, we don't know what was going on in Corinth, people being baptized on behalf of the dead, but he points out that practice doesn't make any sense if the dead aren't raised. And also Paul's apostolic sufferings. He was persecuted as an apostle, um, beaten, imprisoned, um, shipwrecked, uh, under constant harassment for his life and pressured it. He says, um, why do all these things if the dead are not raised? So there are huge consequences if Christ has not been raised as premise to states. And then finally the third question that Paul deals with in the course of this passage is the scenario of the last things. Um, what is going to happen at the end? And this is addressed in verses 22 to 28 where he says, that the last enemy to be destroyed will be death, uh, the dead will be raised eventually, there will be the end time resurrection, all things will be put into subjection to Christ, he will be on the throne, and then Christ himself will be subjected to God the Father so that God becomes everything to everyone. So Christ's resurrection is the forerunner, it's the harbinger of our own resurrection at the end of human history. In Christ's resurrection we have the first fruits, he says, of the harvest, a representative sample of the harvest that will come. In Jesus' resurrection, the resurrection, so to speak, has already taken place in advance in Messiah Jesus. And that is, Paul says, the foundation for our confidence and hope that someday we too will rise from the dead and that therefore these disastrous consequences that he lists will not in fact ensue. Any question about this second uh, part of the first half of the chapter? And the last part where it says uh, until everything is subjugated, destroyed all authority or put everything under him. Does that, how does that relate to Acts where it says heaven must receive him until it's accomplished? I think it has more meaning in that interpretation than the fact that he finished the payment at the cross, that Adam was fully restored. Mm -hmm. I'm, I've not tried to relate it to that passage in Acts that you refer to. Um, it, it seems to me that what it's talking about here is a kind of uh, submission to the authority of the Father. During his earthly ministry, Jesus... Um, did the Father's bidding, um, and ultimately when everything has been put under Christ's feet, under his authority and 
under his throne, then Christ himself will deliver this kingdom to God and say to God the Father, this is your kingdom and will be in submission to God the Father himself. That's the way I understand it. Yes, over here. I think this will be the, our last question and then we'll close. Um, so my understanding of this is that this is like a modus tollens form yeah. of argument, not B, therefore not A. Then yes, not that's a, right. I mean, this is a, so funny for those yeah. who deride the use of logic in theology, because what you've got here is, as you say, a very simple argument. Paul says, uh, not P implies uh, not Q, but Q, therefore, P, which is, as you say, modus tollens. Yeah, I think it's really cool that Paul articulates that argument in that way. I mean, it's completely logically sound. The question I would ask about it is, it seems to me that the crux of the argument would rely on the first statement um, being completely sound and non-exclusive. And so I don't, I wanted to ask you if, if anybody has sort of debated that, like said, oh, well, there actually could be situations where the yeah. first statement isn't correct. See, the part of the problem is that we don't really know what these Corinthian heretics believed. It's, it's hard to imagine that they, these, they could have been Christians and denied that Jesus was risen from the dead. So did they believe in Christ's resurrection, but then said there isn't going to be anybody else rise from the dead at the end of history? Um, we just don't know. It, uh, but Paul is assuming here that any reservations they would have about the resurrection of the dead at the end of human history would apply to Christ as well. We'll see when we get to the second half of the chapter that they seem to be repulsed or revolted at the idea of the materiality of the resurrection. They, they didn't want to have this earthly body with all its grossness resurrected and brought back to life again. But I think Paul would quite rightly say, but that's exactly what happened to Jesus. This was not some spiritual resurrection from the dead. Christ rose physically and bodily from the dead. And so he would be right in saying that if the dead are not raised, then Christ wouldn't be raised either because the same objections would apply. And we haven't heard of any other groups that have objected to that other than potentially the Corinthians? I'm not aware of any, but there probably are some because every heresy <laughs> under the sun finds some exponent someplace. All right, let's close, shall we, with a, a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you uh, that we have this hope that reaches beyond the grave and gives us confidence and strength for bearing the crosses and the infirmities and the trials that you call us to endure during this lifetime. Help us to do so in the power and strength of our risen Lord, through whom we pray. Amen.